All right. Thank you, Dr. Benneker, for everything you do to organize these. And then thank you, Dr. Nornight, for accepting this. So it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Sam Nornight from Texas A&M, where he is a uh, associate professor of practice in the Harold Vance Department of Petroleum Engineering. Prior to joining A&M, he, he worked for both BP and EOG, uh, both in drilling and as a completions foreman, as drilling engineer. And nowadays, his research focuses on really driving drilling performance improvement within drilling itself. And he spent a lot of time last summer working with the team at Forge to look at uh, optimizing hard rock drilling. So today, um, Dr. Norinette will be talking about, is it just a hole in the ground? Um, Physics-based drilling practices impact on geothermal drilling. So with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you, Dr. Shore, Dr. Vinegar. Um, and I uh, thank you everybody for joining. I, I've sat in your seat as a graduate student and uh, I know you've got a lot going on. So I certainly appreciate you taking time to add your schedule to listen to this. And um, again, I, as uh, Dr. Vinegar said, I, I actually can't see the chat on my screen, but uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions. You know, I'll, and if we don't get enough time there at the end, um, yeah, I can try to follow up with you. So, uh, and I will say as a slight caveat, uh, I had this wrong on my calendar. I was thinking I had until tomorrow at uh, 11 your time, noon my time. So uh, if it seems a little rough around the edges, that's because Dr. Benneker was able to get in touch with me and uh, let me know it was, I was a day off. So hopefully this uh, flows fairly smoothly. Um, like, like Dr. Shore said, uh, I'm, you know, teach drilling. Uh, this, is, this is what I do. And uh, my research is, is fairly focused. And even my work outside the university is, is really uh, essentially the same thing, just, um, you know, applying it uh, with clients. Uh, the research, I don't have a slide on research. I know that, you know, sometimes your, your seminar speakers will, will do that and kind of pitch their research programs. But what you see is, is what, what we do, what I do for research. Um, so the way I put it is I don't have a lab. Um, I literally do not have a lab on campus. Uh, my lab is drilling rigs. So, um, and, and what we're doing is we're taking physics-based drilling practices and we apply it uh, to drilling operations. And so this is an example of that. Um, and hopefully you get a, a good idea of what, uh, what we do. I uh, will note that this is uh, very closely based on uh, this uh, SBE paper. I think I got that number right, um, that will be presented at the upcoming drilling conference. Um, and whether or not you're going, uh, I would say that uh, it is a very comprehensive paper. And if you're at all interested in this, um, you know, please download it. It's, it's, we ended up writing it uh, at the end. It's almost like a halfway drilling manual for hard rock drilling and for geothermal drilling. It is uh, quite the long paper. I want to say 35 or 40 pages. So um, it's uh, again, very, very comprehensive and that's cut down. <clears throat> I kept this title. Some of you have probably seen this. I, I gave a presentation to IEDC um, a conference or forum this summer and I've used a version of this title throughout the years because I think it's it's very applicable to what we do in drilling um, in general, right? You know, we kind of get viewed as, well, you know, it's just a hole in the ground, right? How hard can it be? Uh, and when it comes to geothermal, there's no doubt that's the attitude, as, as Dr. Short can attest to. That's the reason y'all are starting up your, uh, your geothermal center institute there, um, because there is a massive amount of need. You could call it opportunity, but really it's need. Um, to bring the geothermal drilling um, practices and just everything associated with that forward in order for it to be a viable technology and, and a way to produce energy. And we can't support it via government subsidies forever. So uh, it's up to people such as, in reality, such as yourselves, the graduate students um, in the future to uh, determine how to do that. So we're going to be uh, focusing on the forge pro project. Um, and this is, you know, at the end of the day, this is, this is what we did. Um, so uh, what you have, and I apologize, I'm not on the smart board here. Um, so I'm going to have to use my mouse, but um, 
what you have is uh, the gray line there is the previous well and you could call this kind of a typical well for the forge project uh, you can see on bottom hours that's that's rotating hours 550 hours you know we're talking in terms of days it can be you know 100 plus days um, this is the first well this is actually in progressing in order um, of first second and third wells that uh, uh, in the um, project and so you can see uh, the rather dramatic change in terms of uh, in terms of drilling performance. I would say that's your. I always in when I'm in you know, you know speaking to U.S. audience, I'll say you know that's that's your taxpayer dollars at work, and you know they should they should thank me for saving them millions of dollars. But I, you know y'all are in Canada, so it's not your tax dollars at work. But um, so Forge, in case you don't know. A uh, really interesting program. Uh, strongly recommend looking them up. Uh, they've got uh, a really good website, and uh, actually, all the data from this is uh, public. Um, it, there may be a one or two year hold on some of it, but uh, as a being a DOE project, uh, it's it's required to be public uh, if you can find it you know, on the website. Uh, again, it's funded by U.S. Department of Energy. It's a very large project. It's been ongoing for a long time. I want to say over ten years. Uh, in some form or fashion. It's administered by the University of Utah. Uh, essentially, they're the operator. Uh, and it's similar to, if you've uh, heard of or, or seen the research coming out of the HFTS, um, I think that's what it is, HFTS uh, sites uh, down uh, here in Texas, uh, looking at Permian and Delaware, you know, DOE funded field sites, um, rather large projects, you know, very experimental. Uh, this is a very similar uh, project. It's hard to tell from this picture, uh, but one thing that is unique to this, uh, this is um, in uh, southwestern Utah. Um, this is an actual producing geothermal field. So they are actually producing energy and, and sending it um, to the grid. And you can see off in the distance, actually, it's kind of hard to see. But, uh, you can pick out a, a wind farm down here. So, um, and that's actually, a, I believe that's a commercial wind farm. Um, what's unique geologically here is that this is actually a rather steep or relatively steep hill that's, that's coming up again. It's, it's the drone view that's not showing it very well, but um, this is a valley in here. And then um, as you come up the side, uh, it's, it's a hill and it looks a little bit like this. You know, so I don't know if you call it a mountain or not. Y'all probably wouldn't. Uh, me being from Texas, uh, I would call it a mountain. Um, but as you come up, uh, the geology that, that is, is following it right up. So extremely steep dips, uh, you know, 20 to 30 degree dips. Um, but again, very interesting ongoing project. Uh, and it's continually, you know, they're continually adding new aspects and, and you know, testing out and trying new things. Uh, right now, the current, I guess, focus from an operation standpoint, I guess, would be uh, the eventual completion of a second deviated well to twin this first deviated well and then uh, they will try to do uh, they're discussing doing some fracturing between the wells um, i'm not privy to all of what they are planning but that is the last thing i heard so again um, very cutting edge stuff going on there a lot of high end geoscience um, work so as I noted, uh, it's, it's very steeply dipping. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of honing in on this is one thing that I do want to emphasize for, and I think most of you realize this, although it certainly bears repeating, uh, you know, coming from oil and gas, you view geothermal as, as kind of this vague geothermal, right? Uh, if you put that in reverse, that'd be like somebody in geothermal saying, yeah, oil, gas, oil and gas is all about the same. And of course we know it's not true, right? You can have a, um, you know, a shallow water flood field that's at, uh, you know, a thousand feet, you can have ultra deep water well in Gulf Mexico, you, you know, you can have an unconventional well, and they're all very, very different um, down to the mechanism of, you know, how do you produce the oil and gas, how's it flow? So geothermal is really no different. And if you, I'd, I'd certainly recommend looking into all the different types, but again, we can range from, uh, you know, a well that's uh, 50 feet deep in the back of somebody's yard, um, to a well like this, which is, you know, 10 to almost 11,000 feet 
uh, in solid granite. From a drilling perspective, uh, there, there are a wide variety of um, conditions you're drilling in. Um, we've, we have, uh, we were supposed to work with an operator. Unfortunately, COVID got in a way that was drilling in Hawaii on the side of a volcano. You can imagine some of those drilling challenges there. Um, you are drilling a very high temperature um, formation. So things like steam blowouts and, and things that we would never heard of in oil and gas uh, can pop up. Uh, and there is uh, that this particular field is definitely lacking in one thing that many geothermal um, developments have, which is lost circulation uh, related issues. So most of the geothermal development you see um, will be in a, formations that are prone to lost circulation. I, you know, I would say highly fractured, perhaps even bugular type uh, geology. This, uh, this development does not. And so you could call that a limitation in a way, but what it allowed us to do uh, is really focus in on some, uh, on some key parts of, of making whole drilling performance and not having to worry about some of the uh, some of the operational concerns that come with drilling very hot, highly fractured formations. But if you're looking for a, uh, you're looking for research topics, you know, that is certainly something that is problematic and, and can be a real issue in terms of cost and time. These are science experiment type wells. So uh, that's why we did um, on bottom hours for a lot of our plots, because there's lots of stopping for coring logs, et cetera. It is a discontinuous program. So one well at a time. Now, that is a really, really important um, because this is really one of the primary issues from geothermal in general. And I don't know if you know how many geothermal wells are drilled in a year. It depends on how you define it, but um, it's somewhere in the ballpark in the United States of, of 20 to 30 in a year, which when you think about that, that's, that's pretty amazing in terms of a small number, right? You know, small independent oil and gas company or junior, I think is what you call it there in Canada, uh, could drill 20 or 30 wells in the next two months, right? So we already have a problem in terms of drilling performance or just general knowledge. How do we maintain knowledge? How do we continue uh, and work on improving wells when I'm going to drill one or two wells this year as an operator, lay the rig down and come back a year later? it's pretty difficult to retain those knowledge and to build on gains. So what can we do around that? Um, you can see the well design here, obviously varied well design, some odd hole sizes, and that's driven by the, uh, by the science. Our role, we were, a, a, I have a separate DOE project, so I, I'm not associated with Forge. Sometimes people ask me to do um, anything on that. I'm, I have no association with them in terms of like a, um, funding or even authority with them. So we are just working in parallel. Um, we're awarded uh, this based on some, this is essentially the same thing that we've done for oil and gas companies um, for the last five or six years. We're just doing it to geothermal. So in a way that title, is it a hole in the ground? Yeah, you know, it is from that perspective. Drilling geothermal wells is the same as drilling oil and gas wells. If I encounter high temperatures in geothermal wells, it's the same thing as encountering high temperatures in oil and gas wells. And that can be a little bit of an issue because there is a little bit of a firewall between the two. Um, at least uh, you know, people seem to think that, you know, that they're different. Um, but from a drilling perspective and from a completions and geophysics perspective and all the things that you know as petroleum engineers, it's uh, physics is physics, right? It's gravity doesn't change just because we start drilling the geothermal well. It's the same physics that we've all learned. Our role, um, and I say PIs, I think I'm actually technically the only PI, but this is a, a project that Fred DePriest and I are, are doing together. Fred just doesn't want to deal with the PI aspect of it, um, is was training, developing workflow, um, working with them in, in real time, you know, just 24 seven monitoring. But uh, this is kind of important. We didn't have any authority over what was done. We couldn't mandate that they do a particular thing. And I'll talk about that here in a second. Okay, so that was a great chart, right? I should have just flashed that chart up, days versus depth or hours versus depth and said, man, you know, mic drop, right? Walk off. Um, and it's, it's pretty impressive, but you know, how do we do this, right? So what kind of cool, cool stuff did we do? You know, what kind of moonshots did we actually make to make this work? Now, 
I want to say on this slide, each one of these people I'm about to call out, I, we loved working with them and we want to work with them again. But this is what you generally will see um, for drilling performance related stuff is, is that people will uh, kind of miss uh, the general, miss what we're trying to do here and they will start to attribute it to, uh, to the wrong thing. So first off, the results were real and they were expected. Fred and I fully expected to have results. Now, I don't know if we expected to cut it by you know, 75, 80%, but um, our, we would have said, in fact, we did say in the proposal, the expectation was 30% reduction in the first well. So they were expected. They did not though come from a particular service contractor. Frontier Drilling is a great company to work with. Could HMP your neighbors have done it? Absolutely. So this is not, you know, somebody, the only one person that can do that. They did not come from a specific technology or branded tools. It doesn't matter what color the bid is painted when it comes out. It didn't matter what mode motors were down hole. Um, the process that I'm going to talk about here shortly is, is independent of tools uh, or, uh, or, or things like that. Now, again, NOV says read high log, but NOV um, was an excellent partner and uh, was critical to the success of the project, but it was not because they were blue bits. It was because of their own internal workflow and, and their engagement in the project. And they didn't come from anything secret. So there's, there's nothing secret at all. In fact, in this SBE paper that I'm telling you about, I mean, if you download it, you will see there's actually two pages of exactly what you should do in the next forge well. So, that, you know, there's no secrets uh, there. Um, and this is done with physics and, and, and knowledge that, uh, that we actually all have and is fairly intuitive. So, you know, this is a great kind of way to, uh, to look at physics-based drilling practices and a way to view the way the industry has worked, um, oil and gas and geothermal, certainly geothermal for some, uh, to a bigger extent. So this is attributed to Desmond Tutu. I think it's actually maybe somebody else that did this, but you know, there comes a point where you need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out where they're, why they're falling in. And you know, that describes a lot of drilling, right? And really a lot of other practices, but uh, you know, we just accept, essentially we accept wells similar to this, whether in geothermal oil and gas, and we call it normal. The last 10 wells or 20 wells or the last two years or, or 10 years, the wells have all looked like that. And maybe there's a slight improvement over time, but we generally accept this as normal. And so what physics-based drilling is essentially saying is, okay, you see what you got now. Why don't you figure out why you're limited? Why are people falling in the river? Let's go figure that out. By the way, um, just so that it's always, it was, when it really became impressive for me was I was out on location and they were coring um, somewhat ineffectively. It's rather difficult to core uh, this kind of rock, uh, solid granite. The core came out and it was the exact granite that I have on my kitchen countertops. And they were drilling four to 6,000 plus feet of granite countertop. It actually had this exact same pattern. So. Um, I guess when forge is done, they have a they have a secondary life as a uh, as a um, as a place to go get more granite countertops for everybody. So, uh, but that's what they're drilling. So, what's physics based drilling? You know, what is that? Um, it's it's basically workflow and knowledge put together. One doesn't work without the other. And it's predicated on this rather simple plot. So this is when I teach this class, I teach a high performance drilling class, actually just um, every spring. Um, when you hear Fred Dupree's talk or you see me talk, I mean, you're gonna see this plot. Some of y'all probably seen this plot several times over. Um, and it, it's a pretty simple plot, but it's pretty powerful. So what we have is ROP and weight on bit and in a system that's efficient, you know, no dysfunction, no whirl, no stick slip, we apply a certain weight on bit and we should get a certain ROP. So our bit should indent a certain amount. You know, we're assuming a constant RPM. And so we should have a certain ROP in a given rock. This slope will change if your rock strength changes or you know, for your system. But for the given system you have in the hole right now, this, this foot, this one minute, uh, this is what you can expect. Now, 
when you go nonlinear, that's when there's something wrong. This is what we would call a dysfunction. So this is something like whorl, stick slip, interfacial severity. This would be a bit on bottom type of dysfunction where you see a nonlinear response. Bit balling would be another example in shallower hole. And so what the physics-based drilling workflow and, and what it is, is understand what's limiting you, understand the physics. So before you can mitigate bit balling or mitigate world, you first need to understand what's driving that and what causes that. Then you can redesign or in real time, we had, you know, there's plenty of practices you can do in real time on the rig for certain dysfunctions. Uh, apply that and in turn, what that will allow you to do is move further up the line. Again, you notice that this is a line, right? So uh, and that's gonna be critical here in the next slide from a workflow perspective, but you can see that the only way to move up this line is to have this knowledge. Otherwise, what does this become? This becomes normal. And those of us that have worked out in industry or been out on drilling rigs, or, and again, I'm saying drilling, you can apply this to, to completions or production, but you see a response, it's not ideal, but it's called normal, therefore it's accepted. And a big part of the class that I teach actually is almost halfway management theory of don't accept this as normal. You know, drive, you know, what can you do to move your team past accepting this as normal? Create a workflow to understand this and move up the line. And of course, you run into it again, right? So you don't ever really solve or eliminate. Um, I try to use, use the word mitigate or delay onset um, as a favorite of Fred's. Um, and so Again, we are just, you know, these dysfunctions are there in the system, but what can we do to mitigate them and allow ourselves to move up the line? In other words, the question that your operations team should be asking is, what is limiting us from applying more weight on bit? And that's, that's the key question. So um, an important thing about it being on the line, and this is, uh, I grabbed this from a, uh, from, um, some slides I just used last week in class, you have on bottom dysfunctions, but we also have in this process, and I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about it today, but just be aware there are other things on this line. And so the power of this concept is, is that right away, there can only be one thing limiting us at a given time for a given foot of hole or interval if you wanna make it a little bit bigger, right? So, and you know, your, your first intermediate hole section what is keeping you from applying weight on bit? Well, we can all list 20 different things, but the reality is there's only one thing that's keeping us from doing that. And so that's, that's the one of the more powerful things about this approach is it focuses your team and allows you all to really hone in on, okay, what do we need to understand in order to improve our performance? And it can be any number of things. And I don't have it on here, um, but one of these dots could be drilling manager. Right. Dr. Shore could be your drilling manager and he could have said, you know, I ne I've never seen a bit with more than 35,000 pounds on it. Therefore, you will not run that. Right. OK, so how do we fix that part? This is where the knowledge comes in and I'm going to touch on it throughout the presentation. But the key to this entire process, the key to our project and our results was not that Fred DePriest and I came in and told everybody what to do. Quite the opposite. The key was that we came in and we trained everybody from roughnecks up to drilling managers on physics-based drilling, on the fundamentals of whorl, stick slip, interfacial severity, etc. And then once they have that knowledge of how things work, then the team can work together to develop the workflow to continue the, the redesign process. Uh, I'm not going to read each one of these, but this is, you know, it's a workflow. It's a plan, do, analyze workflow. It's, it's really the same as any number of workflows that consulting firms would come and try to implement in a company. Um, this is, I think this is actually what we put in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, if not, this is probably what's going to be in the presentation there at the IEDC conference. But um, this is really uh, the workflow for um, for Forge when we were working with them. So again, you're planning, you're you know, understanding the limiters, you're identifying risk. And unfortunately, I don't have time to get into you know, all of this, but understanding risk, you're 
running field trials, testing stuff, analyzing and repeating. So the result of this, the first result is that we, we brought all the, the entire drilling team in and trained them, uh, trained them for two days, which was pretty short, but it's generally about what we get with an operations team. And then the first step out on the rig, again, remember the rig is our lab, is we're out there and we're monitoring Payson or, or TACO or whatever we're using. In this case, it's Payson. And so we're doing step tests. And this is where we're seeing the result of increasing weight on bit. Can we increase weight on bit? Can we increase RPM? Do you reach a point of where it's a nonlinear response? And what's going on? We're measuring this via MSE. Hopefully everybody's familiar with the MSE concept. I just realized I didn't put that equation in, but if you aren't, it's, it's pretty simple. Essentially what it says is, is that in a lab, if I am drilling a rock, all my energy in to the system, to the drilling system should be equal to the rock strength. Uh, so uh, the, the paper that started this was Teal, T-E-A-L-E -E, um, back in the 60s. Um, and again, it's, it's essentially energy in, um, should equal rock strength as your energy rises, then obviously there's uh, inefficiencies in your system. So we monitor MSE uh, and as MSE rises or falls, then we can tell the we can see the effect of um, changing parameters, changing the inputs to the system, weight on bit and RPM. So how are we using this? Well, one, one way that we're using this is, is the bit damaged? So bits, um, PDC bits do not um, wear, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second, but PDC bits um, are damaged over a very short period of time. Now, this is one foot in a hard rock. This is what you'd expect. Um, you're drilling ahead. You're fine. You, there's no issues. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's done. Um, and so you can see that very clearly in MSE. So MSE is a surveillance um, tool where we establish a baseline and it's it's continually coming back to this baseline. Uh, so in other words, the, for a given rock, I should have a constant MSE. I should always be coming back to this baseline. It'll bounce around as, as you know, parameters change slightly or something like that. But we keep coming back to this baseline. Zoomed in, you can see here that we're running around 42,000 PSI, uh, which is actually in granite. This is pretty close to rock strength. So this is a highly efficient drilling process at this point. Um, and then you can see it take off there right in the last foot. And of course it comes out looking, uh, starting to get sharpened down like a pencil. Um, but this is, this is what MSE is telling us. And so what MSE does is it gives the, um, the crew, the operations team confidence. It gives them confidence to run higher weight on bit to try some of these things. And it gives the drilling engineers the ability to monitor and get real-time feedback. I don't need to drill five wells to see what's going to happen when I run higher weight on bit. I can run high weight on bit for the next 10 feet and see. This is a concept we talk a lot about, but high weight on bit doesn't wear bits. Um, now, I realize that there is you know, somebody in a graduate student crowd is going to argue, well, you know, there's a little bit of wear. Uh, you're right. There is a small amount of wear over time, particularly in granite but it is relatively insignificant. Um, generally, it's pretty hard to see, actually. Um, but uh, the cutters, no matter your opinion on how much it might wear in granite, it wears from sliding distance. And so this is a critical concept for a rig crew. And once they see this and understand it, it's pretty powerful. So if you increase weight on bit, I'm indenting deeper. So then for each revolution, I'm removing more rock. And so just like this picture here on the left, we can see it that at 150 feet per hour, if you do the math and, and you calculate the sliding distance of a cutter, um, you can see that, um, and I'm trying to think, uh, I think that might be per hour, um, if I remember right. At 150 feet per hour, uh, it will slide 10,679, kind of just following the spiral down. At 50 feet per hour, it's 30,000 feet. So from a wear perspective, cutters wear from sliding at lower weight on bit, we're indenting less, we're drilling slower, and so you're going to have more wear. So what's the response in, hot, in hard rock? This is one of the key findings here and key things that we proved, which is run high weight on bit. 
if you don't run high weight on bit, you're exposing your cutters to significantly larger amount of sliding distance. And in hard rock, you will start to get some noticeable wear and, uh, and, and some issues that will come with that. So increasing weight on bit up to the strength of the bit body, which is depending on the bit size and um, is probably somewhere in the 75,000 pound range, uh, which it was for us. So we we're actually reached the, reached the limit on a lot of our runs and we were limited by um, the actual material of the bit. Another um, pretty interesting concept uh, and story that we were able to uh, first identify and then, and then show uh, is the high spurt loss um, or high spurt fluid story. And, and some of you have probably seen this and uh, have experienced this. You may or may not have realized what was going on, but uh, in a very short summary, we have ductile and brittle failure modes when we're drilling. So brittle failure is just like it sounds as you're drilling ahead and, and this cutter is moving through the, through the rock. It's, it's coming off in chips and chunks and pieces. Ductile is the rock is essentially deforming and it's almost, it's really moving and it's coming apart grain by grain or moving grain by grain. Definitely a much less efficient drilling process. Um, when you're in ductile failure mode, you're drilling about one third the ROP that you would be in brittle failure mode. And the best example of this widely known example is the, the Bakken. Um, and so if you look back at the Bakken uh, 10 years or so ago, uh, they were drilling with typical uh, low weight viscosified drilling fluid. They went to a, a clear brine, a lot of times just produced water. ROP increased three times consistently across the board, across operators, across areas in the field uh, for the ones that did this. And the reason for this was change from a ductile failure mode to a brittle failure mode. The physics of that are essentially that having a high spurt fluid. So if you remember your test, if you did this in undergraduate or you did it in mud lab where you, you pressure up on the cell and it's, the fluid shoots through the, the paper and you're looking at the, um, the graduated cylinder there measuring how much comes out in a certain amount of time. Usually you want to limit that if you remember from your mud lab. But from a drilling performance perspective, if there's no other issues keeping you from doing it, by having a high spurt loss fluid, you're able to create a, a scenario where the fluid has penetrated around and in between uh, chips or you know parts of, of the rock here in front of it. And what that does by having the same pressure inside and out, now there is no force keeping this down. So the, the chip is free to move. If you can't get fluid penetration into the um, pore spaces or the, the pore spaces created by the changing um, of, the, of the rock particles, um, then there is a, there's a force keeping this. Now I don't want it, it's not quite chip hold down effect, but it, it's sometimes called that slight, slightly off. But anyways, for argument's sake for today, we can, we can use that, um, but that's, uh, that's what's going on. So. We felt like that's what we felt like that is something that was going on. We had a few instances where um, we noticed that they were pumping sweeps and we saw some increases in ROP. And this is again, this is part of the process. You see a change, you notice a change in MSE, uh, you see a change in ROP, you're trying to figure out what happened. And so the field trial that we did on the last well is we took. Uh, this is drilling ahead uh, with just a, a typical a low weight for this um, uh, operation, a low weight, you know, essentially almost water viscosified drilling fluid. Now, remember, no fractures, no lost returns, nothing to worry about there. So what we did is we pumped a pillow of 100 barrels of water, which accounted for about seven minutes of, of flow through the bit. And you see here in the MSE, about 85,000 um, baseline. When that fresh, clear water, and this was just perfectly clear water, uh, was pumped, the MSE dropped essentially by half in return, as one would expect in a system like this. We go from 30 to 60 feet per hour, and then we go back. Okay, so what do we do? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, company men started calling around, and the next day we went to a clear fluid. <clears throat> and so this is that's a good example of 
identifying potential issue, understanding the physics. If you didn't understand ductile versus brittle, this would have never been something to try. Um, trying it, seeing the results, and then making the change. Okay, so some unique patterns, uh, and I'm, I know I'm bumping up, getting close to bumping up the time, but uh, should be fairly quick here. Um, some unique things that are coming up or some things that, uh, that we saw that I'm kind of thinking in terms of future research, future work problems that one may expect or see in geothermal. One thing that was kind of funny is, is borehole patterns. And I say funny because like I said here, what is old is new again. Um, on the 16A well, which is the first well that, that Fred and I assisted with at TD, uh, they were gonna do a REMA run before running their, uh, their completion, their production stream. Uh, and uh, Fred and I have been too uh, desensitized to that via unconventional um, shale wells and, and even uh, certainly you know, offshore low strength rock. And we said, you know, there's, we think that's a waste of time. Um, there's, you know, those ledges and all that, I mean, it's, you've been rotating so long, it's, they're gonna be worn off. Um, they went ahead and did it. Fortunately, they did because they had a lot of trouble reaming down. In fact, they got geometrically jammed in um, with the reaming assembly. And what we realized, uh, which should have been, which was obvious in hindsight, is that hard rock does not lose the ledges. Um, and so this is something that, you know, we see a lot of proposals for deviated um, horizontal wells in hard rock. Uh, and this is going to be a quote unquote new issue, right? Which is, I think, specifically something to consider and remember, but also something to, uh, it, it's always good to remember that uh, there's a lot of things that have happened in the past and it's good to go back and, and look at them again, right? So again, what, what was old is new again. Um, there's a lot of uh, very old drillers and company men who would have laughed at us um, who worked in West Texas and Oklahoma who had seen us for decades and decades, right, before we started drilling horizontal shale wells. Um, the solution to this is uh, oral um, prevention, uh, borehole preve uh, pattern prevention related to BHA design. These, uh, by the way, this, uh, this data, so these are um, uh, 3D um, calipers. Uh, that was taken and then digitized and, and created these, these patterns here. But you can see um, pretty dramatic patterns. And uh, in shale wells, we just really don't have those micro ledges and some of that. You know, this, we might have a pattern like this, but you know, a lot of these little tiny ledges are worn off in the wells that we're used to drilling these days. For future work, one of the biggest unknowns is this particular phenomenon. So we've got a lot of ideas, we've, we've got a lot of concepts, everybody from NOV to Frontier to, to GRG, all the folks that were involved has, has their own theory. And um, we've tested some of them and so far we haven't found a solution, but it's this asymptotic ROP response. And what you have here in the left track is ROP in green. Um, and you can see if I were to flip this around and make it horizontal, um, you could use it to teach the Klein curve analysis, right? I mean, it's just a perfect decline curve. And so you trip, you put a new bit in, maybe a bit different bit design, and it's this kind of perfect change. Um, not always there. Um, there's obviously some changes here and there. Uh, but again, uh, that's, that's probably in terms of the biggest unknown and our, our future focus. Uh, there's an upcoming well. Uh, in fourth quarter of this year, and this will be at the top of our list, is trying to understand this phenomenon. Now, this is a phenomenon that we have seen pop up in other areas. So, for example, in the Delaware Basin, we're looking at some data with a company, and we noticed this. Uh, so, it's not can particularly, uh, may not be a hard rock issue, and we're not sure. So, anyways, there's, there's lots of interesting ideas on that, um, but that is something we're looking at. So, just a quick summary, and I and this is a, if it's not a screenshot, it's a copy paste of, of the um, summary from this SPE paper. So, you know, we we were successful um, in applying this. It started with training the rig team. It started with bringing everybody you know to training, empowering them with knowledge. Once they have knowledge, then they're going to want to implement that knowledge and do it the right way. And we found find the limiters, we would redesign, 
in other words, come up with the solution to it, test it, see what happened, find the new limiter, et cetera. Um, baseline MSE surveillance, which uh, Fred will be presenting a paper on MSE at the IEDC conference. Again, I recommend downloading that. It's going to be very, very comprehensive and will cover uh, MSE calculation, use of MSE, and most of his examples are from this FORGE um, project. Um, there's a lot of bit redesign. So again, I don't want to say it was all bits, but the key there is that it was the service company, NOV in this case, was very involved in the process and was that was a huge part of the success, was having them on board with the workflow. Um, we did reach the limit on the on weight on bit um, for a lot of these bits in terms of matrix um, strength of the bits. Uh, and when you reach that, we found other ways, you know, the high spurt loss fluid. Uh, so that's going to wrap up what I have. I do want to acknowledge first off Fred, who's uh, again is the co-author on the paper, lead presenter, and you know, of course the you know the person who's been pushing this industry wide, able to the person who went and found Teal's paper and, and actually realized there's something to it. Uh, of course, DOE and University of Utah, um, and then everybody that worked on it. Again, I, those first few slides, I didn't want to come off too strong as saying that you know it was all us. Quite the opposite. What I wanted to imply was that it's not laser drilling. It's not anything Star Wars or Star Trek-ish. Um, this is just taking the understanding of physics, which we already have, applying it and seeing the results. And so from a research perspective, what this should tell you, no matter what your research area is, is that you can do the same thing, right? You have, you have knowledge. If you can take that knowledge and you can teach a team out in the industry, you can then apply that knowledge and you can get tangible, immediate results. The lasers and the plasma drilling is cool and we need that for the future at some point. But right now, there's a lot of opportunity, whether it's drilling, completions, reservoir, uh, particularly in geothermal. So there's there definitely uh, a lot of opportunity for you there. Okay, there we go. So that's, uh, that's the uh, drive-by summary of uh, what we did uh, in the uh, in the forge program so far thank you very much for that uh, interesting presentation um any questions from the uh, from the audience uh, i saw see some some comments in the chat maybe um, someone could raise a hand and ask a question or unmute yourself let's see um I will answer one thing. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, Catherine mentioned that lost circulation is is really um, it's a big issue, and it's and that is an important thing if you're looking for an area to focus on, or if you ever you know somebody's wanting you to go work for a geothermal driller. Uh, yeah, be ready. Lots of lost circulation and really nasty lost circulation, losing into. Uh, high temperature bugs that will turn around and blow steam at you. I, I'm not, yeah, it's probably not something you want to encounter if you can. Um, yeah, and so, and then she also said something about the number of wells drilled in the geothermal industry. You know, this is really, really critical. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money being thrown at geothermal, right? And, and honestly, and I think Dr. Shore and I talking about it, there may be more, um, geothermal research programs than wells drilled um, this year, right? So, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. There's not a lot of application right now. So, you know, I don't know, it's interesting. There's a lot of different ways you can go off from that particular observation, and, but, you know, be aware of it. And then, um, you know, drilling with water, I mean, yeah, if you can get that is a good comment. She said that you know drilling the water is normal, and a lot of times that's because you're just losing it, right? Uh, this forge area is again, it's a granite countertop that we're you know at roughly four thousand feet, three to four thousand feet. Then you're in granite countertop for the next six to seven thousand feet, and so things like lost circulation, where a you know somebody's watching this and you know they're going to be drilling some wells somewhere else, they would say, well. I mean, you know, we don't encounter that. That's that's not our primary limiter. Um, yes, you know, but it's like I said in the very beginning, 
uh, you know, geothermal drilling is just like just like oil and gas, right? There's some things will apply in one field and, and not in another. But yeah, good comments there. Catherine, did you want to speak to that? I see your hand raised. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Samuel. That was a great presentation, and uh, and thanks, Roman, for the 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 last minute invite. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I have a lot of experience in drilling geothermal, particularly high temperature geothermal wells, and that's where my comments have come from. Um, what I found that was particularly different is, of course, when you're drilling in a sedimentary basin and uh, you, you know, you're dealing with these basically salt or anhydrate, and you have to essentially prevent, um, well, yeah, prevent the dissolution as you're going through. But I really wanted to stress that um, it's for drillers trained in sedimentary basins in the oil and gas world, geothermal drilling is very different. Um, mm -hmm. My first drilling project was actually in a, a high temperature system called Mount Meager here just north of, um, of Vancouver. And um, we had two crews from Alberta who had never drilled in granite. And it was no end of problems. Um, so, so really important that people understand that one, there is a difference in terms of drilling technique. It's not just apples and apples. Um, the wide diameters, the extra depths are really important in terms of your well design and your drilling. Uh, um, uh, you know, essentially, I, I really liked your point about learning and training and getting people all to understand what the goals are. And, uh, and lost circulation is something to applaud and don't let your drillers plug it. <laughs> as long as it's below your production casing, don't <laughs> plug it. You're gonna kill your system. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. th thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Darlington, you have your hand up. You have a question? Hi, my name is Darlington, and I work with Professor Roman Shaw. Um, I just wanted to ask that uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. The first question is, do you have a platform for other drilling researchers to plug into the work that you've done there? Because um, that's a lot of money spent, and it's not everyone that will have the same opportunity to carry out that kind of research, but is there a way to connect with your organization and do a joint research. And then secondly, I have been fortunate to play around with some of the data in this particular field that you did, because like you said, it's um, publicly, uh, it's public out there. And I noticed that the azimuth was going all over the place. So I was just gonna ask that, um, I know that's a vertical well based on the inclination, but why is the reading of the azimuth um, all over the place was that was that the intention uh, yeah so uh the asthma depending on which well you're looking at um uh, was probably the well was spiraling the first one for sure the 16a unfortunately i don't have the i wouldn't know where to look at my computer but i actually plotted um we had a perfect spiral going down where it just uh, was spiraling down so that's probably what you're seeing um which depending on the amplitude of the spiral can be uh not a good thing so actually going back here you know this is kind of a spiral pattern so your azimuth would probably be changing as you went down and depending on that uh that period of the spiral uh this is where you start getting into increased hole drag reduced ability to apply weight on bit stuck you know geometrically sticking reamers things like that but yeah that's what you're seeing and as far as the research um the group um is you're kind of looking at it, me and Fred and uh, one student. So <laughs> I don't have I don't have a fancy setup like Dr. Shore there. Um, but no, I mean I would just say you know look the paper it's public that's going to be published. I think lays out pretty well um, what we do. We do teach I do teach the class every uh, spring. So you know, if you want to get in depth stuff on it, um, you know shoot me an email and I'll keep you on the list for spring. And and I've got. This semester, not so much, but uh, usually we'll have 20, 30 percent, you know, people from industry taking class. So I'm used to a lot of distance learning students. Thank you. Um, I see some more questions in the chat. Oh, so uh, let me answer Richard Hawkers. That's really important. Yeah. 
Uh, no, we were not using DAS. Um, uh, this is, you know, it, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have to be that fancy. Although um, the underlying fundamentals of DAS are very closely related to this because DAS came actually from Exxon and, and was licensed uh, to Payson. But uh, no, so this is just a driller, company man, drilling engineers, you know, watching Payson or Totco or whatever you're using, watching that data. So um, no fancy tools. Do you think that uh, you might have gotten even better results with it? Or is it like you thought maybe you didn't, it wouldn't bring any extra? Or... <clears throat> um, maybe, maybe not. I think the problem with DAS is that it, if you, you kind of punch go and then you do stop, right? At least every 30 feet. Uh, DAS doesn't tell you what to do to make the next run better, right? It, it mm. my issue is that it kind of takes the drillers, it definitely takes the drillers out of it, and generally it takes the rest of it out of it where you're just kind of relying on it. But, um, it may have reached a kind of a local maximum, so to speak, for, for weight on bit for a particular interval. But what's, what's keeping you from going to an even higher? maximum weight on bit well das that's where das i think stops and you've got to have a workflow in place to keep pushing through this approach by watching weight on bit msc watching your parameters there essentially kind of doing a, a das in your head that that workflow of continually going up the line is is natural with that but i mean das is a great product i don't i don't want to knock it but no we didn't use it great thank you <laughs> Right, and then I see one more question in the, the, the chat. Uh, yes, the the, paper. yes, so the paper will be on, let's see, the paper will be on the SPE on one Petro, right? Um, whenever, I guess a week or so after the conference, usually is whenever they post it. So mid-March, you know, it'll, it'll be posted. So, um, and there'll be several there. If you actually look up, uh, I would look up the priest D-U-P-R-I-E-S-T. Um, he's the author on three pretty important papers um, that will be presented at IDC. So if you do the priest, you get them all at once. Um, vibration data, yes. Um, we did have some vibration data. I don't know if it's available. We have some issues with that. Does it have correlations with MSE? Generally, yes, right? So that's where, you know, really, that's where PDC bits fail. That's what causes damage. Um, and vibrations, of course, in a rotating system indicates inefficiency, right? So higher vibrations, more energy being dissipated to friction and, and heat and other things. Um, and so, yeah, increased vibration will generally um, result in increased MSE. The key with vibration data, I will note, and Dr. Short definitely knows this because more in his wheelhouse, where is your sensor, right? Always ask that question. If you put your sensor in the node versus the anti-node of the sine wave of the VHA, you get very, very different um, answers and, and very different output. But um, yeah, vibration data is, is pretty important. And I foresee that that's something that going forward, you'll see more and more of as we get better at, at, at acquiring it. Vibration data in geothermal though has one big limitation and that it's a little bit hot. So um, you get down deeper in these wells, geothermal wells, uh, there's not really any sensors available. So any vibration data for the forge wells are in the upper part of the interval uh, down to six, 7,000 feet probably. Um, a symptom, yeah. So this one, the question says, uh, ace, the asymptotic ROP might come from cumulative effect of borehole patterns. Uh, we actually looked into that. That was one of the first things we thought. Um, we were not able to find any correlation to that but yeah that's a that's a very good thought so you're thinking the right way there um, we were not able to see that not to say that that's right because we don't have a definitive answer but it's uh it's the big mystery right now for us yep and you can add another another group looking at that, at that right now because the team here is looking at that same exact problem and yeah we're scratching our head <laughs> yeah yeah so it's, we've looked at everything from uh, we looked at the ductile brittle failure, you know, uh, fresh, you know, very, very fresh water. I mean, it's, we did amazing amounts of work trying to get really clean water. Um, we looked at 
uh, just micro essentially doling, like growing the chamfer essentially? Was that going on? I mean, we have uh, we've run down a lot of dead ends, unfortunately. We don't know. And like I said, the one thing that's interesting is that it's not just forge, it's not just hard rock. We're seeing it in other areas uh, at times too. So not quite sure where that connection is, but you'll, you'll see it in a lot of a lot of wells where you're drilling triples with the top drive and horizontal. You'll see it on every stand. Yeah, yeah. So these uh, these forge wells are um, that I don't know. I don't know if I put it down. Uh, they're not quite horizontal. In case somebody wants to know, uh, we got up to 67 degrees. Um, but the loss of ROP was actually in vertical. So you know, it's vertical, horizontal. <laughs> uh, I haven't been able to normalize or eliminate anything yet. Um, all right. Thank you, Ika, for your question. Um, any other questions um, until we before we wrap this up? It's almost twelve. So. Uh, oh, so this is a question about uh, drilling. You know, what are we doing in terms of steam? So first off, uh, I it's actually um, was it Christine? Is that the right? Yeah, Catherine. Sorry, got the C right. Uh, Catherine said um, there's some things that are very uh, geothermal focused. Running into steam is one that. Uh, from drilling engineers down, that's that's something I personally don't know how to handle from a 100% oil and gas background. So uh, we're not really looking into that. But yeah, I mean, there is a, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of work on that and, and a high focus on that. If you've ever been out on the geothermal operation, then you know that things even such as just handling the pipe as it comes out of the hole is a problem. I think the geothermal industry probably has that down. You know, they know how to deal with it fairly well, but it certainly is an issue that you know, any team will have to deal with. Um, and I will say that I think the opportunity for us is not, um, not necessarily in things like that, right? The opportunity is in a lot of the unique projects that are being proposed, you know, parallel horizontal wells, right? Um, you know, drilling in places not, you know, in Pacific Rim, right? How do you make a geothermal, um, you know, development economic uh, in the middle of Texas? Right. We don't have you know, geothermal reserves or, or anything like that where you would put geothermal wells. So how do you make it work in a 250 degree Fahrenheit you know, rock? Uh, that's really what the DOE and other government entities are really wanting. If, if you look at, you know, read the RFPs and, and what they're uh, spending money on, that's they want the, I guess you call it unconventional geothermal to grow. Or is it EGS, I think is the term they use. All right, thank you. Um, I see Catherine is speaking to this in the chat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so um, with that, I would like to thank you again for, um, for joining us for this uh, great talk and um, thank everyone uh, in the audience as well for joining. Um, I will have this recorded. Um, so um, if anyone knows someone who might want to uh, review that video, just uh, send me an email. Um, and um, we can go from there. Uh, I, thank you again, and um, have a, uh, a good afternoon, everyone. Okay, you too. Yep, thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you, Sam. Thank you.